territory that I do, which is a lot of cultural analysis kind of stuff. So here's the thesis, um, which is we are beginning to exit an art period that I am calling the corporate period. Um, if you are familiar with art history or music history or uh, even history of drama and things like that, we tend to divide uh, we tend to divide history up into these different periods that are defined by their style and defined by you know how music is performed, how art is actually created, how it's drawn, as well as the culture's relationship with that art form or art in general. Uh, just as an example, if we're looking at you know common practice music, the earliest period that we really look at is the medieval period. And the medieval period runs all the way up um, maybe into the 15th century, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. And if you look at the medieval period, you find that almost the entirety of the medieval period is focused around religious music. That is uh, music that was performed as part of religious ceremonies, part of the mass uh, in particular. So chant, um, organum, chant evolving into organum, involving into late, late medieval proto-polyphony and things like that before you start to get to the Renaissance period, which is likewise dominated by religious um, religious music, but is starting to see more record of folk music. And I want to start with the medieval period because it's important to note that we study religious music of the medieval period and we study the liturgy of the medieval period, not because that was the only music being produced, but but, but because that is what we have records of. So there has always been a folk music that is the music that people commonly consumed played performed amongst each other you can think like drinking songs would be part of the folk music tradition and then there's been other traditions that run parallel to those mix with them or separate themselves from the folk tradition and when we get up to the corporate period you're going to find an interesting mix of these two things i think so i want to lay that foundation there was of course secular music in the medieval period and of course most music was actually secular but it wasn't recorded, and one of the only ways that we have secular music recorded is with lute tablature. And this is partly because lute tablature was designed for players to transmit and take notes about what they were playing on the lute, but also because a notation, formal music notation as we know it, hadn't yet been invented or was in the process of developing. If you guys get yourself like a Liber Usualis, which is actually now repressed since Vatican II, um, just a book of chants and things like that you'll notice that it's written in what's called pneumatic notation which used to still be taught to um to priests as you know before vatican ii basically uh, it's written in four lines rather than five line staff and looks very very different but it it's what predates and, and comes before our modern notation system so once we have that notated because the church needed to transmit those chants that's when we start having records of art it's different with drawn art art that is visual statues things like that we have ancient statues we uh we've uncovered you know frescoes from the roman period so with visual art we actually have a much bigger and broader idea of what's going on than with music but it's the same thing with art you find that there's a difference between art which was created for specific purposes and specific styles such as religious ceremonies and then art that was created by the folk or for the folk and depending on what which period you're looking at there's a little bit closer association there so uh, we have the medieval that kind of binds things up in this style and also this relationship with music um, and with art uh, where art tends to be focused on you know there's a lot of artists that work for the church a lot of art that's made as part of you know say illuminated manuscripts things like that and then by the time you get to the Renaissance period, then you have a different focus on art. Um, you have Renaissance drama. You have this big explosion of drama with things like Shakespeare and uh, many others, but Shakespeare is the one that, that tends to be the most famous. Um, you have an explosion of visual art where you have a, an increasing of detail, a rediscovery of ancient um, ancient traditions from the Roman period uh, in visual arts. And then in music, you have the development of polyphony and harmony. Now, harmony... For those who study church history, harmony was originally uh, not performed in the early Christian church because it's inherently emotionally manipulative, which is an interesting thing to think about. So by the Renaissance period, we start getting harmony. Polyphony is what dominates the, the history of music. 
Um, Renaissance art has its own styles. We start to have perspective and we start to have broader um, compositions, compositions that include multiple highly detailed, accurate figures. So the um, the art starts to be the object itself rather than be a representation of the object. Um, so it, we start getting iconography in the, in the Renaissance period that's incredibly realistic. Um, whereas if you were to look at, say, a side track, the iconography of the, of the late Eastern Roman Empire um, leading into the Renaissance period tends to be much more um, abstract in a way, a little bit unrealistic. Here, we have a super chat, $2. You are awesome. Thank you. Hive time, Tyrant. I appreciate that. Um, once we get past the Renaissance period, we start to go into what is typically called the Baroque period, named after a Baroque pearl. Of course, these periods are usually named after the people afterward, right? So the Renaissance was a rediscovery. Uh, Baroque was about doing things that were grotesque. Uh, that is, things that are highly detailed, highly figured, and complex. That was what the relationship of art was. That was the artistic goal in a broad sense for most of the art, which was produced either secularly through patronage, produced um, secularly through market relationships such as opera, or produced for the church. All of them had this goal of producing highly complex and um, very, very deep levels of art. So in the Baroque period, late and high Baroque, you get you know, J.S. Bach. Um, of course, you get all of the Italian masters, you know, Monteverde and Vivaldi and all those. Uh, French composers and Baroque art, you start to see a parallel there as well, where in the visual art, the composition gets increasingly more complex. And rather than say, you know, in the Renaissance, we, we have this view of, of some of these really outstanding Renaissance pieces, like say Michelangelo's David, which is a single statue of one figure. And you have say the Mona Lisa, which is a single portrait of one figure. But you also have more complexity in the Renaissance too, you know, the Last Supper or say the Sistine Chapel, which is incredibly detailed and huge. Whereas the goal of the Baroque starts to be to really have a lot of stuff going on. So most of the fountains that you see in Rome are not from the Roman period. Obviously, most of those did not survive, but were in fact built during the Baroque and um, the period following the Baroque, depending on what art you're in, would be kind of the Enlightenment or... Um, or the classical period, if you're looking more at music. So um, the Baroque period would have the, you know, the statues with multiple figures, just piles of figures in marble. The paintings would have a really large scene fe featuring like a central historic figure, you know, maybe the king, and then there's a huge amount of detail in the background. So rather this kind of subdued background that we get in the Renaissance where everything's focused on the figure, in the Baroque, it's like the background becomes just as important. And you also have genre painting emerge in the Baroque. Um, genre painting, of course, very popular in um, places like the Netherlands and Belgium, where, you know, you just are painting peasants or painting people playing lutes is a whole genre in the Baroque period. Kind of interesting to think about. So these things are kind of bound together. So we get medieval, Renaissance, Baroque. After that, we start to get lots of other things. We get the classical period in music, get the enlightenment. You start to have the romantic period, which across all art tends to focus on the emotional. Then you have the post-romantic, which is taking that to the next level, taking everything to the theoretical next level. You have these big operas that Wagner would do, like the Ring Cycle, that was just three nights of three or four hour operas, like 12 hours of opera, like going to see the Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. Modern period is where it starts to get interesting, and this is where I want to lay the you know the final floor before I talk about the corporate period. So if I'm going into too much detail here, I apologize, but I promise I have a point with all this. So by the time we get to the 20th century, we have a very, very interesting set of things emerge. So we've had genre, we have genres before this. We have genres in fiction exist before the 20th century, but we start to get what's called a genrefication of art to a greater degree. So there's genre painting. There's also, you know, historical fiction as a genre. Um, you know, if you're reading Sir Walter Scott or someone like that, uh, there's historical fiction um, as a genre. And there's other literary genres that are kind of exclusively 19th century. There's even Gothic literature, which really begins in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, you, you have this divergence in approaches to art between art which is created by and for the folk and art which is existing in this other more academic mode. Uh, we have start to have a rise of states 
states increase in size. I'm talking about um, governments. So the government be- increases in size and power. So one of the first things that happens when the government really explodes in size at the beginning of the earliest 20th century is there's a world war. And then uh, most of the countries respond after World War with fiat currency during the uh, World War One, and uh, all the socialism which followed World War One then explodes into World War Two. So World War One and World War Two, if you zoom far enough back, seem to be a direct result of states, states getting big. This is also when you have an explosion in the university system. So. Uh, we start to have a a big change in the dynamics of society in the 20th century. And of course, that changes the way that art is produced and the way people relate to art. So down one avenue, we start to have art, which is modern, the modern period. So if you're ever studying art history, you'll go in and you'll study this art from the modern period, which is going to be early 20th century. You have things like cubism as a, as a visual art, and you have things like 12-tone music in music. And the main relationship with art and aesthetics in the modern period is a belief in the ability of man to create things which are new. So modern buildings are those big, blocky skyscrapers. Um, postmodern buildings tend to be just like geometric shapes and other nonsense you know that it could look anything could be aesthetically pleasing so the postmodern anything could be art anything can be aesthetically pleasing aesthetics are completely subjective modern is we can create new aesthetics with new meanings that do what we want them to do so of course there's a tight relationship with the state itself the entire relationship of people who are running the state and the state is no longer a state serving a purpose or a state representing people or a state representing culture. It becomes a state that we make the state what we want it to be to do what we want to to do in society, to make society what we want it. So rather than the state having a relationship with people, it's like the state is supposed to be affecting people. This is very, very much um, in the... (coughs) Sorry in the Marxist and Leninist traditions, but it is, of course, present in America as well. Uh, It's when we get the Federal Reserve. It was like, what was the Federal Reserve? 1911 or 1908? I'm trying to remember. Um, So yeah, we get the Federal Reserve, which is where we take over the banking sector. No, the state takes over the banking sector. You start to get old age pensions in the Weimar Republic. You start to get things like social security in the United States. So the state begins to affect society in a way that the state is a, is a ring of power that we can use to affect society. Um, and that's the, that's, the, that's the modern. So in an artistic sense, the modern is about taking a new design that you've created and using it to make art, which affects people in new ways. So we get things like 12-tone music. And if you've never heard the music of Arnold Schoenberg, I've talked about this in past streams. It's very harsh and dissonant. Most people don't like it. So if you're studying art history and you're looking at something like cubism and you're looking to postmodern stuff like, you know, Jackson Pollock, uh, you might come to the conclusion if you had never stepped outside before or never seen anything outside that class, you might come to the conclusion that there was no good art in the 20th century, that the 20th century was about people really hating their art. And... Um, the 20th century was about people really hating their music and it's like what a horrible time to be alive like 1920 to 25 would be an absolutely terrible time to be alive because art was so bad but because of genrefication we have a whole different thing going on which is art which is created for patronage art which was created for the folk and art which is created by the folk goes down its own path and in music that path just continues the post it continues the post romantic and impressionist traditions but in ways that people don't think so jazz music actually takes onto itself all of the theoretical devices of wagner holst richard strauss all of those the post romantic music theory gets transferred into jazz by the time we get to bebop and even before then so we have a folk music which is primarily associated with black Americans at the at the outset, but has become multiracial as time has gone on. Um, the These black musicians actually begin playing with this highly complex theory that is derived from post-romantic um, 
music theory. Now, post-traumatic music theory is merely a continuation of what's called common practice music theory. Common practice music theory is the tonal system which was discovered, not developed, um, throughout the course of, of history in every culture. So just so you you guys know, if you go and you look at every culture, you'll notice every culture uses a tonal system which is based on mathematical relationships between pitches. If you compare this to Arnold Schoenberg's music, Arnold Schoenberg's music takes the 12 notes of the piano. You can't see my piano next to me, but takes the 12 notes of the piano and says, well, we're going to give them all equal weight. They're going to be all equal. Well, it is, I wonder what that has parallels to, guys. It's, it's more of that modern socialist ideal. So... Um, and of course, the result is hideous, just like socialism. But he takes those 12 and says, we're going to create these rows so that all 12 tones are heard roughly the same amount in a composition. They're all equal. The thing is, is that the 12 notes of the keyboard does not represent reality. I have gone over to in, in, over in detail this in various music theory lectures. But the reality is the 12 notes in equal temperament tuning is an approximation of pitches. We adjust all the tuning so that we can play roughly in every key only a little bit out of tune, but they don't represent the math there. Um, and if you were to, to actually start with a pitch and you were to go up the harmonic sequence, you'd find all the notes for both the major and minor scale are, are within that. So the theory of the post-romantic is merely using the tonal system to its maximum ability. It's using every tool available to affect the, the listener and make them feel passion. Whereas Schoenberg, you either feel annoyed or nothing most of the time. Now, I actually have an appreciation for Schoenberg's music, but that's the modern aesthetic. And so the modern aesthetic, because it's hated by people, basically is a completely artificial co construct. And if we were to go into the future 200 years, and we were to look at art history classes taught in 200 years, what you might find unless there's been an active attempt to suppress the reality of music in the 20th century, what you might find is that there'll be a couple of lectures on this weird thing called modern academic music in the first half of the 20th century, some of the composers that were there and how this was taught in universities throughout the 20th century, but that no one really listened to it. It was very unpopular, and uh, orchestras may have played it. State-funded orchestras often played this for people, but people generally didn't like it, and most state-funded orchestras always had to play Beethoven, Brahms, or Bach if they wanted people to show up, and that's that's reality. The L.A. Philharmonic, um, which I've actually played with the L.A. Philharmonic. I'll tell that story sometime. Uh, but anyway, the L.A. Philharmonic's got to got to program some music that people like because even in this dense metropolitan place that's full of academics, people still won't show up to an orchestra concert unless there's something from the 19th century or before on the program or something newer that's that's say minimalist. Minimalism is a is a style that shows up at the end of the 20th century, which is returning to the tonal system, not um, rebelling against it in any way. So what we get is this popular, popular style. So jazz is a great example. Now, if we're looking at something like, and I'm looking at some of the comments, if you're looking at something like high art or low art or something like that, these are these are constructed ideas. Uh, I call it music of the folk and other things, right? So there's a classification, which is the music, which is made by and for the general population of people. Your average person without musical training enjoys this music. Then there's other there's other things that go with it. So obviously the music music that's composed by um, you know Jacobus Obrecht for the Catholic Church in the 15th century, or actually he was lived in the 16th century. Now people heard that at the church, but that wasn't something that people wanted to hear or were even able to hear on a regular basis. Remember before the invention of recorded music, people never heard music unless they could perform it themselves. So folk music prior to the 20th century tends to be way simpler than it is today. And I point this out to people that are like, music today is so dumbed down. It's like the music of 400 years ago that people heard on a regular basis was monophonic drinking songs, bro. It's not more complex than what we have today. If you're comparing Beethoven to whatever rap, mumble rap garbage you hear today, you're comparing music that no one heard when Beethoven was alive. Like barely anyone heard Beethoven and he was immensely popular. Most people never heard his music or if they did hear Beethoven, someone might've played Beethoven for them once or twice in their life. You're comparing that to something that is played at Applebee's or whatever, right? It's not a valid comparison. So going down this this line. So that, that represents the modern direction. And this is 
primarily something that becomes insular and focused in really a small subculture of academics and only becomes prolific as academics teach it to their students. So if you go and you study art at the university level, you may have to study modern art and you'll be encouraged to produce modern art, not to produce art that uses classical styles. And chances are your education in classical technique, even up to and including holding a brush, might be absent from a modern art education at the university level. Um, and so we get that. We get that that happens in both art and definitely happens in music. So if you're studying, say, music or art history, you also get to this period called the postmodern. And the postmodern is different from the modern in that it's even less popular. So the modern still had Stravinsky, you know, and it still had Bartok and some of these composers that, that still use the tonal system and mixed it up and just did really original things. But by the time you get to the postmodern, you get guys like Milton Babbitt and John Cage and a whole slew of other composers that will probably be a footnote in 200 years because their music is unlistenable. Aleatoric music is one of the things in that you get in the postmodern period where, you know, I had a composition teacher um, and what he did was he would take rice and dip it in ink and throw it at staff paper on the wall. And wherever the rice hit and made a mark, those were the notes. Now, do you think that that's going to come out being beautiful and enjoyable to people? It's going to produce sound. Uh, but the whole point of the postmodern is that anything could be art or anything could be enjoyable or aesthetics ultimately are subjective. And when you say everything is subjective, you're really saying aesthetics don't have any kind of deeper meaning that they can point to uh, because the meaning would be universal. So aesthetics, if they're not universal, then they don't have any, any kind of deeper meaning uh, at all. So <laughs> Jesse says they might be absent. They're totally absent. Yeah. So uh, they talk about art technique in a modern art school. It's the same thing with music and music composition. You might totally lack some of the classical techniques. Although I will say that the usually music education tends to focus a lot more on, on classical techniques and how to actually play your instrument. They just don't necessarily hold people to those standards, particularly in composition schools. Um, so anyway, that's the trajectory. And so if you go study art history now, anything past the 20th century, you're actually not studying what is relevant. You're studying the most irrelevant garbage that nobody cares about. And in 200 years, nobody is going to, there's going to be two lectures in, in a year long seminar course on this weird academic music that people made this, this bizarre noise music that was popular in the sixties and seventies and the orchestra music that was played at universities, which was unlistenable, you know, it's like, why did people do this? And you might have a lecture about, yeah, well, People were forced to go to universities in order to get education, to get a job. They were funneled through their institutions to do this stuff. So let's talk about the real stuff. So from the 20th century onward, we have um, we have the development of mass media. And this is where folk music starts to get very interesting. Um, the first big development in the United States was jazz. Coming out of ragtime, which is a folk style music played live, we start to have jazz and the explosion of jazz in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and even into the 50s. And so that explosion of jazz, what it's fueled, fueled by big time, besides there's actually state support of big bands, <laughs> um, which happened in the 40s, um, but we don't, we don't need to talk too much about that. It's mostly about the, the medium called a vinyl. I don't have any vinyls in this room, unfortunately. They're all in my record player in the other room. But this thing called a record, a, phono a phonograph is originally a cylinder that you could record on, but the gramophone, this record. So you could buy this from the store and you could put it on your record player and you could listen to the band playing at your home in your convenience when you wanted to. This had tremendous effects on music and it we have a parallel in film. So film and music are the ones I'm really gonna focus on because they're the ones that amplify this effect and other kinds of art we only start to get this effect kind of sideways in that and then towards the end. And the other form I'll talk about is comics um, because comics represent a new medium that was created out of the mass media explosion. So with music, you have this re this record. You could put, on, put your gramophone on there and you can listen to it at home. This is the first big mass media thing. You could go down to a store and buy a record of whatever, of Louis Armstrong or whoever you wanted to listen to, put it on your record player, and listen to Louis Armstrong and not just listen to Louis Armstrong's song played by a band, which is what you had to do in the 19th century. If you heard John Philip Sousa, it was because the local brass band was playing John Philip Sousa. 
But in the 20th century, you could hear John Philip Sousa played by the Marine Band this exact same way every single time you listen to it. Not only that, but your cousin who had the same record was hearing it the exact same way. So everybody was not just listening to Louis Armstrong's music. They were listening to him having never seen his physical presence in front of them. And that is the beginning of mass media. And it starts with music because music was the first one that we could put it all in and we could all have the exact same experience. Now there's parallels before that called books. So books are really the first one. Once we have the printing press, everybody can have the exact same book with the exact same words. But it's different when it's a performance element, like drama, like music, because music is not just written and visualized. It is actually heard and felt. So uh, that's a huge one. And from then on, we have a trajectory of popular music that is extremely interesting and own and complex. So if anyone who says that like jazz is most most modern academics would not say jazz is low art but certainly people at the time would say that because it wasn't classical the word classical was just invented to say well we're orchestra musicians and we play like a more high high kind of kind of music but bebop and hard bop was theoretically more complex uh in a lot of ways than the music that um people were playing in orchestras, you know, uh, so it had its own trajectory of complexity. Now, where does the corporate period begin? I would say the corporate period actually begins in the 1950s, because in the 1950s we finally get the equivalent of the radio and the record player, because the radio can, of course, transmit the exact same recording, like they put on the record and you hear it. So the radio, uh, an audio version, we have the television, and so when we have the television, now we have a true chance for mass media to explode. Not only are people watching the same play, like they're watching a teleplay, right? They're watching a TV show. It's a play, but they're not only are they watching the same play, they're watching the same actors at the same time in the same angle everywhere, everywhere. That's incredible to think about. So the 1950s is the beginning of the corporate period. Now, why do I call it the corporate period? Let me explain this. So the corporate period is called that because art all of the high art, all of the art which is popular and which people actually consume um, is produced by corporations. And this includes the high art, the cinema, you know, the Godfather, right? These are made by corporations. Why are they made by corporations? It's because the technological expense of creating the music can only really be funded collectively. And so in Western countries, we have done that through the corporate infrastructure, which is uh, corporations of it's a fictional entity that's protected by government. It's kind of a government recognizes it as it as a a thing like a person that can own property and pay bills and do things that all a person could do, but it's not a person. Um, but rather, it's a collected collection of people's resources being managed by designated people. The, you know, the board directors hire CEOs to hire other people, so they're all there to represent the people who own the shares of the stock. You know, it's very expensive to buy a video camera in the 1950s. It's very expensive to broadcast. It's very expensive to produce content to broadcast. So in the 1950s, you have the creation of the first TV networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, uh, you know, uh, what is it, CBC and um, whatever it is in the, the UK, the BBC, right? So you have all these these broadcasting corporations. Some are government, some are partially government, such as PBS here in the US or the BBC in the UK, um, and some are completely private, such as, uh, such as NBC. And they produce this content and they're able to divide the cost of the content by sending the content across the country to all of their affiliates, which then broadcast it and then they can charge ad revenue from it. They can charge advertisers to advertise the product and deliver this free transmission to people. So it's low cost, just the cost of buying the TV set and you get free entertainment that a peasant would be so grateful to have and even a king would think is interesting a couple hundred years ago. You know, before there was running water, there were running servants. So it's mainly the average person that gets the biggest benefit from corporate art. It's the same thing with cinema, you know, a, a camera which uh, a cinema gra a cinematography kind of camera costs a lot of money. Film costs a lot of money. Hiring all the actors costs a lot of money. 
sound engineers, special effects engineers, directors. Before you know it, the cost is astronomical. So you have to create a corporation to pay for that. Likewise, recording technology is still expensive. And it continues to get more and more expensive as the quality goes up and up and up. So beginning in the 1950s, we have a rapid increase in the quality of the production which is created. And so this is the first thing that, or the first two things that encapsulate what I call the corporate period. The first one is art is made by corporations. And it's made by corporations because the technological costs involved, but because it's so diffuse, you can increase the production. That's the second thing. The production value is completely unrivaled in history. It's the best production value that has ever existed up until that point. And it continues to get better as these companies invest in newer, better technology. And as they are, as they grow, as more people get TVs, that means bigger, bigger viewer base, more money. Money equals attention, right? It's a thing going that we've been talking about a lot. If you have a lots of people paying attention to your program, then you can sell the advertising slot at a higher and higher amount of money, just like with the Super Bowl. Um, so the production starts to go up and up and up and up and up and up. So that's the two big defining characteristics is that uh, most of the art is made through a corporate infrastructure, which decides what art is going to be made and produces it, secondly, at an extremely high production value. Um, so it begins in the 50s. In music, you have first superstars um, with like Elvis Presley that are able to not only make lots of money playing music and be well known as musicians, but are able to cross over to like movie star, right? Elvis did movies. He's a big part of his fame was people saw him on TV and had that extra connection with his physical presence and could go buy his records. And it became totally corporate, like corporate hegemony by the time you get the Beatles. The Beatles are a corporate product because they, of course, they didn't pay for their own recordings. They made tons of money. But ultimately, it was the corporations promoting them on their TV shows. It's, it was the corporate infrastructure that made the Beatles great and made them who they were. If you look at the talent level of the Beatles, I mean, they, they're not talentless or anything like that. They're talented guys. But it's they're not like the Beethovens of the 60s. They were pop musicians that had a lot of great access to money to make really high production uh, quality stuff, such as like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band has unbelievably good production for the time that it was done. In fact, the production, I think really outstrips, um, say, the quality of the theory that's writing the music. It's very stripped-down theory. It's common practice theory. It's rhythm and blues, uh, but it's not nearly on the complexity of, of, say, hard bop, which was something going on at the same time, or even cool jazz, right? Modal jazz, things like that. Um, so anyway, you get uh, you get something like that. And then in the 70s, we have genrefication of music at the popular level, just beginning. You get that thing called heavy metal, where it's no longer about rock and roll and just the pop music, and then jazz, and then classical. It's like there's jazz, jazz fusion, there's cool jazz, there's acid jazz, there's funk, right? Then there's rock, there's R&B, there's hard rock, there's heavy metal with Black Sabbath and Rainbow and Deep Purple and guys like that. There's prog rock, progressive rock, there's disco, there's, you know, Folk rock, all these, all the genrefication starts to explode about 1970 because as more people grow, there's more opportunity for more niches, but it's still predominantly controlled by the corporate infrastructure. It's where you have, uh, you know, the probably the capstone. I'd say the the height of the corporate period is the 80s. This is when the corporate infrastructure was producing the highest quality art, of the highest value to the culture of the highest amount of popularity and the highest amount of common interest that the world has ever seen. And I'd like to give you a couple examples. So I think it really kicks off with uh, Star Wars. Now, it's not to say that there's other not other great art before Star Wars. There's like Godfather, there's tons of great movies, and there's tons of big hits that occur before Star Wars. But Star Wars begins it. Star Wars is this thing that's like, it's so huge. Everybody has this common experience called, we've all seen Star Wars. And then there's two other movies that are Star Wars movies. And you have these what are called high concept artists like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg start to really explode and make some amazing films. If you look at most of the films people have nostalgia for from the 80s, 
These are things which had a really deep connection with culture. They were widely popular. They were incredibly well made. So Star Wars is a good example. Indiana Jones, great example. You had things like uh, Alien, Aliens at the uh, 70s and 80s. You had things like Back to the Future. You had, of course, like the Terminator movies, if you go into the rated R area. You had movies like The Goonies, right? Uh, there was so many high concept films that came out in the 80s and really stuck. Now, we, of course, we forget most of the garbage from the 80s, but there was also that music. There was, in fact, what a lot of people call corporate rock. And the word corporate rock is something that I get in music history classes. If they're trying to talk about popular music, they're like, there's these corporate rock bands. Journey, Genesis, stuff like that. Corporate rock. It just means rock that's pretty set a really high production value like Boston. You know, really high production value that lots of people like. The 80s is the heyday. It's the the absolute pinnacle of pop culture, what we call pop culture. And that is also when the corporate uh, period is at a zenith. And it's when the corporate period is producing the highest quality art that has the the biggest reach and the biggest cultural impact and the longest lasting cultural impact and relates to the culture the strongest. After this, you start to have a decay. And the decay happens for many reasons. The first big reason is increased genrefication. If you just look at metal music, by the time you get to the mid 90s in metal music, you have dozens of genres. You got goth metal, Black metal, death metal, thrash metal, prog metal, power metal, classic metal. I mean, go on and on. There was stoner metal. Uh, like, There's so many different kinds of alt metal, uh, new metal. Like, there's so many different kinds of heavy metal, and that's just one genre, like one style within this thing. There's gangster rap. There, there How many different versions of rap were there? Right? There was a huge version, different versions of rap. Now, the genrefication is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's bringing, going to bring about the closure of the corporate period in music and the beginning of what I call the eclectic period. So now I would say we're in the eclectic or we're in the genre period. I don't know what, what else to call it. But these common cultural experiences are giving way towards a multitude of standardized experiences. Um, or a multitude of diverse experiences, which are less standardized, so the non-standardized experiences. So in the 90s, we had some of the biggest blockbusters come out. This is when you had the heyday of, of Disney, right? Disney cartoons, generally those early 90s cartoons were dynamite, every single one of them. Highest quality animation that had ever existed, high quality writing, highest quality music, highest quality everything. You had Jurassic Park come out in the mid 90s. But about, uh, you know, I've had a couple friends say 1997 is year zero. That's when the cultural collapse happens. After 1997, there's a dramatic decrease in the quality of the corporate art. doesn't mean there's none, right? You still have Lord of the Rings. I like to look at Return of the King because I think that one came out in 2003. It was probably the last good best picture. Last good movie to win best picture in the... And if I'm using good as in it is widely popular, relates to the culture, affects the culture, and is accepted and loved by the culture. It's the last one. So by 2003, the run of corporate art having deep relations to the culture at large is mostly run its course. So high art relating to the culture is done. And what you transition to after that is you transition to basically genre films that are just heavily invested in superhero films, things like that. Okay. So you get, that's, that's what you get in movies. Uh, and you get the same thing in music. Now there's a huge collapse that happens around the year 2000, a little bit after in the music industry, the music industry, which is highly court, still highly corporate. Like you don't realize that say morbid angel had a ton of corporate support in the nineties, uh, bands like cannibal corpse had a ton of corporate support in the nineties. They were, they were supported by corporations. They had a, a record label that paid for their recordings, paid for them to do it, paid for them to go on tour. They worked for a corporation. Metallica is corporate rock. They worked for a corporation They're called Electra Records, which was part of, I think is now part of Warner. I don't remember. At some point it was point of Warner might be part of Sony now. Um, so, about 1997, 
appears to be year zero where things really start to go off the rails. Hollywood, if we just look at the Hollywood, I call it Hollywood, but let's just call it the corporate infrastructure in music and, and film, starts to become very disconnected from the popular sentiment. It's not really producing art, which affects a lot of people. Whereas in the 80s, there might be young people and older people who might like the music of the 80s. By the time we get into the 90s, almost nobody who's older likes anything from the 90s. So if you were a teenager in the 80s, you generally hate everything from the 90s. If you were a teenager in the 90s, you like things from the 90s and everything else as well <laughs> because there's other good stuff. But you start to get a separation there. You get those depressing, cynical 90s. And so the last gasp of the music industry tends to be these ultra popular pop acts like Britney Spears, NSYNC. This is kind of the last gasp. Now the collapse happens because of Napster. And it's not because Napster is an evil company that made an evil product and allowed people to steal the music. It's really because the consumer saw a better value opportunity. The consumers looked at Napster and said, wait, I don't have to pay $20 for a CD full of crappy music that has one song on it I like that I can't even listen to the others before I buy it. I can just download the album for free. Where do I sign up? So the collapse of the music industry, make no mistake, is due to piracy. Piracy is is the seed from which all the crystals grow and it is the primary thing which has destroyed the music industry from the corporate level. Now, once we get outside this idea of the corporate level, you know, the corporate entities crashing means the music industry is over, then you're going to see that a lot of music industry is better than it ever has been. Um, actually, I'd say the music industry is better than it has been since the 80s right now. A lot of people don't see it that way because I make these things like there's no there's no money in music because we, we start to have some amazing things happen in the in the 2000s. So the music industry collapses because consumers no longer have to pay. They no longer have to pay overpriced music. The fact was is that CDs were way overpriced. They were much higher percentage of um, of an income than what, you know, vinyls were. So back in the 70s and 80s, you bought vinyls, you didn't have really anything else to buy, but they also were like way less expensive compared to to CDs, even at the time, like you know, my my parents had a bunch of vinyls they bought for like fifteen cents a piece. It was like buying a comic book. They were a couple bucks, you know, for most forty uh, fives and things like that. And you bought singles and stuff like that. Um, and so the corporate period first big collapses in the music period. It starts at the end of the nineties once people have um, alternatives to paying too much for mass produced music that everybody's into. And so the genrefication accelerates that. People would much rather, you know, buy, and the internet helps that as well, because now I can buy Immortal Records starting in the 2000s from Norway that I'd never hear on the radio ever. So it's great for bands who were a little bit outside the mainstream because they could grow their fan base. They could get more people interested in their music through the internet. And it's bad for the bands that really relied on MTV and the corporate infrastructure because the consumers lose interest and they stop being willing to pay outrageous sums of money for music that they consider subpar compared to all the other things they get to listen to. Um, now there's an art form that I've kind of passed over here, which is comics and comics deserve special attention. The music industry is really begins this, but comics are, are different in their own way. Comics, of course, need the corporate infrastructure because it costs a lot of money to print them and distribute them. Not that it costs so much money to draw them and write them. Uh, they're actually fairly cheap to write and draw, so they're very profitable up until the 1990s and the end of the 1990s when that industry starts to collapse as well after about 1997. Then it starts to collapse for its own reasons, and the reasons really boil down to the genrefication again. So we start having um, comics that are really focused. They're drawn by people who are comics fans. They really are focused on highly stylized art um, and these kind of long soap opera stories rather than having that mass appeal. We also lose a lot of the genres that existed in the, in the 70s and 80s. And so instead what we get are a bunch of repeats of titles. You end up with corporate milking. So Marvel and DC 
basically go into a mode where they are milking old IPs rather than creating anything new. And that, of course, is going to accelerate a collapse. You are no longer bringing in new customers. You're instead just trying to milk the long tail as much as possible. And that caused the collapse. Marvel was bankrupt until Disney bought them. So they were bankrupt at the, in the early 2000s and Disney bought them and resurrected them, bought them primarily to acquire their intellectual property rights, which they could then use to make movies. So the collapse of the comic industry is worth noting because, you know, rather than consumers getting some alternative like what they had, like they had with music, consumers lost interest before the internet like crushed anything, um, and they lost interest mostly because the corporate hegemony of DC and Marvel, you know, you end up with a two basically two player system and a bunch of indies that people really had a hard time accessing. You have that just milk the consumers and stop producing anything new or interesting. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at comics. It's just a little bit different side tale there because they were extremely popular in the 70s and 80s and 60s. People forget this. People think comics are like some kind of weird, I've, I've made content on this in the past. People think comics are some kind of weird nerd thing. It's like comics were super popular when I was a kid. You know, you could buy them at the drugstore, not at some comic book shop. You didn't have to do that. Um, so yeah, comics are their own thing. Now, movies are interesting, and I wanted to look at movies because movies have remained corporate. Like, we haven't had this big collapse of movies yet. Now, why haven't we had that? Well, the first reason is it's very difficult to make movies on on their on your own. In music, starting in the 2000s, we start to get a drastic decrease in the cost to produce music. You can produce it on your computer. By the time I was in graduate school, I could record an album on a computer for a couple hundred bucks or free. Just use the university's equipment, right? So that's a big change. Now, uh, in books, we also have a similar change in the 2000s, which is why we also have the corporate period in books. I kind of ignored books because, again, they're not. it's not the same as seeing everybody seeing the same person doing the exact same action from the same angle in a dramatic presentation. But we'd also have a corporate collapse in books that has been going on for about 10 or 15 years. And that's mainly due to Amazon, but just the explosion in the internet offering people the ability to you know, further divide their genres and publish their books to the few people who are interested in them uh, and just do an end run around the, the corporate system. So once the corporate system's established, I think you can see this with comics, it becomes a ring of power and starts to be exploited. It becomes a necessary and appropriate for them to gatekeep and therefore also becomes the source of a lot of dysfunction in the corporate system. That you get a project approved not because it's good, but because of other factors like your sexual relationship you had with uh, a producer. That's what gets you the part rather than you actually being the best actress. Uh, that is a real thing in Hollywood. We know it is, and it's the result of the corporate system. But the corporate system is persistent in movies because it still costs a lot of money to produce a movie. There's so many people involved in movie production that it's still really difficult to organize a movie outside of anything besides a corporation. You can organize it with a small studio, which is a small corporation, or a big studio, which is a big corporation. But we haven't come up with a lot of ways to crowdfund or to just do this on a small scale. And really, it's not just the scale of money, but the scale of people. The more people, the more money in the story. Uh, so the Basically, the corporate response in movies has been to, rather than produce lots of different kinds of movies for lots of different tastes, uh, they're producing the movies with just the lowest kind of appeal, the lowest common denominator. Pure action flicks are what you really want to go for. So we have the MCU, which has done very, very well financially and has produced a number of, of good quality movies, but they don't quite have the same cultural resonance that Star Wars does, I would say. We don't have the same, it's the last gasp is the MCU and uh, big blockbuster movies like say Avatar or something like that. It's the last gasp of the corporate system because movies are the last place in the art from the 20th century where you still need a corporation to produce the product. Now there's one other industry I want to mention before I jump into chat. This has been an hour long lecture and I hope you've enjoyed it. That's video games. Video games have risen to prominence and become an extremely important part of 21st century art, one that shouldn't be overlooked. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, video games were produced by very small teams, small numbers of people, which means they could be produced fairly cheaply. By the time you get to the 2000s, the 
quote, AAA games are produced by really large studios requiring the corporate infrastructure to distribute it and things like that. But we are going to see, we're seeing again, and actually there was kind of a collapse of the gaming industry at the end of the, say like 2009, um, but we're going to have more collapses of the gaming industry as people are able to produce really high quality games with smaller numbers of personnel um, that produce more original things than these AAA games. Right now we're not there. We're not at the place where people can produce movies and AAA games on their own at the level that the studios can. But that's because, dude, 200, a $200 million game or a $200 million movie, it's really hard to do that with a small team. In fact, it's impossible. So until that becomes possible, you're not going to see a supplant, like a supplanting of that. And George Lucas actually predicted this. Him and Steven Spielberg said all movies are going to condense down to these hyper expensive cinema experiences because that's all that's going to be profitable. So what is kind of cutting the bottom out of movies? Well, it's things like on-demand video watching, both YouTube, but also things like Netflix, where people can watch whatever movie they wanted to in the past. People can buy on DVD or Blu-ray any movie from the past and watch it. So you're no longer competing with what's in the theater currently. You're no longer competing with what the two or three other major networks have on TV at, at your time slot. You're competing with all things ever produced ever. And so that's going to cause a major dysfunction. And it's going to come. So we're looking at the close of this. In music, it's already happened. The corporate period is over. It's really interesting because music usually doesn't lead the way as far as art periods go and art styles go. It usually follows. But in this case, it leads the way due to the due to its nature. Uh, and the book one has already collapsed. We've gone from the big six to the big five, and we're probably going to go down to like the big three or four in the next couple of years. Um, movie studios have also been condensing to where Disney buys 20th Century Fox, and now we're looking at just a handful of major studios that are left. So as they condense and kind of become a neutron star of proper IP property ownership. And of course, right now, the corporations are just trying to milk the intellectual property that they own for all that it's worth because the wheels are going to fall off the train. You know, you're running out of fuel. So you got to recover as much money as possible. Try to diversify what you're doing as much as possible. Put your money into theme parks so that when the bottom finally comes out of it, you're prepared for the next phase. But we'll see how that goes. Anyway, let's take a look at chat been an interesting hour of this i didn't expect to talk for a whole hour but that's the lecture so um share this if you're watching the video after the fact share this with other people on youtube 